Hello everyone, today we talk about 13th century Hungary for our historical region series. We talked about 12th century Hungary, we still have a lot uh, to do also for the history of the land overall before the Hungers and uh, we've never talked about too much about the Avars for example. There's a lot of, in fact, later medieval Hungarian history that we'll have to go in, in some depth, especially from a military point of view. and. I have already uploaded something, you know, there is a Medieval Hungary playlist, you can always check that out. So, the 13th century, this, this is an important time. Uh, the most, I would say, uh, important datum or combination of data here is Mongol invasion plus a Hungarian recovery during the same 13th century, right? Uh, there are countries that took uh, more to uh, to come back, let's say, in, in, in force with themselves. Um, this, in part, has to do not much with the, uh, the still heavy Mongol blow to the country, but also to their, say, to, to the country's political and social uh, organization. Poland, that we talked about a month ago, was, um, for example, more politically fragmented than Hungary was, even though, as we have highlighted uh, very often throughout all Hungarian history, what you see is this essentially oligarchic states within the state that is also not even just a kingdom but but, but an empire right if you look um if you read the the the, the, the end, almost endless list of the hungarian monarch's titles you realize that the impressive amount of territories that this magyar um say ethnic core land there was also quite interspersed with, with other you know um, uh, so we had other minorities, to say, better interspersed within it, but still controlled uh, an impressively large amount of territory. And we looked already at different countries in this historical region series videos that uh, highlights this, right, from Serbia to uh, to to Galicia, from uh, from Croatia to Moravia, etc. So we are looking at... Uh, Moravia will, will, would fall, admittedly, under the, for good, under the, uh, the, the, the premislet, the Bohemian control, right? But if you pick Slovakia, for example, that today is uh, an independent country with its own distinct uh, identity um, and uh, nationality and tradition, etc. You realize that this was essentially this, this important northern frontier kingdom of Hungary that um, was also, in that sense, quite close. In fact, not just to Moravia but to Austria. And so we'll see here very briefly, like a bit of 13th century Hungarian history to realize a bit the also the scope, the range of these political interactions, right? We uh, stopped last time with Bela III, King of Hungary, who was succeeded by his son Emmerich, right? Also known as Henry or Imre, uh, witnessing the, you know, the the different uh, cultural influences that existed also over Hungary from from other from other countries, uh, say uh, Germany. But at this point, well, not much the Byzantine world, but still, you know, the fact that. This, this this central European space that was still floating between different cultural uh, areas, uh, let's say. Definitely the 13th century is a moment of great feudalization and westernization of and, and full uh, achievement in the sense of Hungary. We've seen, I made a video about the 13th century Hungarian knight, by the way, that uh, still uh, betrays in his equipment a bit of uh, you know some some step reminiscence right but for the rest it's just uh, in the details or some styles preferences whatever but Hungary had also undergone an important amount as we will see now of, of Western settlement within it also the, the monarchy had played well in this regard to try to curb the the Magyar oligarchs um, in the process with a more concentrated power uh, and problems were uh, definitely always present because of this institutional profile, right? Ultimately, would cause, as we will see, starting from the same century, also Hungary falling into the essentially homogeneous group of Central European monarchies that failed in the centralization process and became uh, elective ones managed by the 
the local oligarchs. Um, uh, Emmerich, uh, as we said, um, had to face uh, revolt stirred up by his younger brother Andrew. Right, there was something in Hungarian culture that was somehow more ethnically close to the succession of the various brothers before passing to the next generation uh, from in, in the royal uh, family. This naturally would, was a dynamic of power we've seen in various, uh, even in the most uh, somehow uh, say updated monarchies. We've seen it in England with Andrew, and it's just uh, in these years um, uh, we've seen it. It was, of course, based on the support that, again, this various, in fact, oligarchs could provide to a supporter or another. And in this sense, amplified by the size of Hungary and this sort of uh, privatization of power locally. Because, uh, again, in entire, like, chunks of country, like, we're sort of mini, mini kingdoms, right, where these people had, that we will see, socially speaking, how this played out, because initially there was some sort of um, freemen to, or gentry to, to bypass that was also connected with uh, with the king, uh, rights conferred by the monarchy. So it, it, this all under, uh, happens within a context of erosion of personal rights that um, was somehow more advanced in the Central European lands than further west. Um, you have also, at this point, the expedition to Zara by the uh, Crusaders, right? Uh, as you know, the uh, Dodge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo, had led the, uh, let's say, uh, the, the Crusader army that had gathered, in fact, in his city, but without having the, the money for the shipping to the Holy Land, um, to uh, to Dalmatia, in order to say okay, saying literally like if you if you reconquer, if you conquer Zara, for Venice, we will ship you essentially for free. You know what this what was like the Fourth Crusade would, would go like. So this was largely also um, an an independent mechanism for how it was led eventually. Uh, from the the best intentions of Pope Innocent the Third, but also would bring, in fact, an enormous uh, result in the conquest of Constantinople herself. So literally, the reunion of Eastern and Western churches under, in fact, the the Roman uh, Catholic one, etc. Then uh, we'll talk more about the Latin Empire that, as you know, was a bit unfortunate, uh, born out of this, you know. Uh, rape, uh, we can't think, but it, it still tells, it speaks volumes about the, the divide now that is uh, like increasing, the gap is increasing uh, b between the, the West and basically any other player uh, that, uh, that had in this case a territorial, in fact, uh, consequence for territorial loss for, for Hungary, but that was still Hungary it was a, a, a Roman Catholic country, right? So it, Hungary is part of still the, the broader expansion of, of this essentially Western Frankish culture, if you want to uh, see it here, uh, towards uh, that will reach even the East. We have seen it uh, in, in the video about the Principality of Galicia, Volhynia, that had important connection with Hungary, that also somehow accepted the sort of union from their Orthodox background, etc. Because everything changed after the fall of Constantinople. So Emmerich was succeeded in the same fatal 1204 by his infant son, Ladislas III. Minorities, as you know, are not a thrill in terms of uh, power continuity. Um, and especially when the young monarch dies uh, in one year, like in this case, right? And his uncle, the aforementioned Andrew, right, also known as Andrew of, of Jerusalem, uh, mounted the throne, stating that, quote, the best measure of a royal grant is its, its being immeasurable. Andrew distributed large parcels of royal lands among his partisans that had backed him in, uh, in the raised throne. It's a very interesting take because basically goes as far as, again, this sort of 
from a Hungarian perspective, like the, the continuity of this Arpad power passed through the sense that it was really an empire. And so if you get this role um, uh, it, from, uh, you know, from just being a regent and that, you know, this has eventually a, also some uh, further consequences, uh, these are really unlimited, right? And in this case, he, he said it actually in the distribution of land to his partisans, but it's still referred to his uh, to his role in the previous uh, crisis. This act of redistribution of land, etc., accelerated a process that, as seen, had already been triggered by by the say the the, the circumstances. That was the loss in power of many of the freemen that inhabited, especially the former royal lands that were redistributed. Because this is also a thing, like you have land on your own, because um, you are here, uh, the, the brother of the monarch, you are well connected, you, you go around, you have already built clientels, right, an authority, hierarchy, you have largely done so by this sort of dynastic private power by yourself so you will not distribute exactly the um, at this point you have actually indebted yourself towards these people who supported you or yes your friends until you know uh, they they ask for uh, a reward and uh, there is really not much you can give without undermining your own power but this royal uh, lands that had that now are in your control, but that are still overall uh, also geographically threatened by uh, by these uh, individuals that are a bit like you we, uh, on a smaller scale. That they, they are increasing their power anyway, and are tr doing this through essentially bullying the the local gentry into submission. They are li really not abiding to like, especially during civil war, the, the general. A rule right of the land as a consequence what what happens is that the freemen living in the in these royal lands lost their contact to the monarch right Tre which threatened their legal status because of course these lands were to be enjoyed some degree of autonomy that was granted by the same donation practically recognition that this were lands either still royal or subcontracted or still properly donated in some way and this wasn't that positive for for andrew in general right when you look at this rebellion etc it's always the same dynamic you struggle to you are anti-monarchy as, as much as you are not the monarch when you're the monarch you invert policy policy right and uh the um uh, the, the the fact that this land was, was lost anyway through this the fact it was the price to your rise to the throne still meant overall that the royal revenues decreased which led at this point to the introduction of new taxes right a farming or tax farming which however was subcontracted to Muslims and Jews that since according to uh, Christian belief and, and law as well who uh, respectively were uh, to essentially to go to hell, right? The, the, the reason why they were tolerated in, in that world is, as we'll see, also the practical uh, the practical benefits of this. But uh, the idea was that, again, handling money, uh, and especially in countries like Central Europe that didn't have this great deal of, of banking or financial activities, uh, if not in the figure of these, uh, sometimes itinerant merchants, sometimes... Uh, say, migrants of some sort, think about the Central Eastern European Jewry being quite developed after, you know, the, the migration from the Khazar Khaganate it was partly converted to Judaism before being destroyed by the Kievan Rus, um, were seen at, as, a, a, as a great um, asset, especially for centralistic policies, uh, because these people could handle money, which would have been a sin at least in the concept of interest, there were ways eventually even the papacy managed to, to, to surpass this. I mean, they, they eventually would make it a, like a matter of, uh, 
say, conceiving interest as as sort of a, a, a compensation for the management of of the fund, right? So not market dynamic it could create this fake value that was a sin and so was at least entrusted to these uh, uh, people who were not meant to to go to heaven anyway in the Christian vision. Uh, so the sense, however, was from Andrew the second now king of Hungary uh, the um, central, of course a centralistic policy it's also an, an anti-oligarchic one because Muslims and Jews remember Muslims were present in Hungary as well because of the ancient connections between Hungary and the Silk Road the Middle East um, the same migrating Magyars back in the day had a lot of connection with places like Persia that remained uh, from the Danube Delta like rising up through the heart uh, the Hungarian heartland so there was a lot of things going on uh, in the previous video I made a video uh, I made a, a reference to the um, to the Jewish and, and Muslim presence as far as the mercantile uh, figures even coming from a way think about Benjamin of Tudela right coming uh, from from Spain etc so actually Hungary had always had this sort of especially from a monarchic policy open mechanism again western knights uh, other foreign traders now we'll see now the, the German colonization etc because it was a way to again counter these oligarchs that traditionally were thinking to be so uh, grafted into their territory that uh, you couldn't quite dislodge them if not trying again to boost some sort of centralistic policy. Now, this thing of farming out to Muslims and Jews was not appreciated, in fact, by the oligarchs, right? Uh, it, first of all, well, it was just a tax. Now, it's an unprecedented one in 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 Hungary. Um, it was uh, an effective method to raise funds for the royal treasury, but it did create widespread unrest. Because it was just an excuse to say, well, this goes against our tradition. So what, whatever it is, uh, we have the the infinite excuse to say no to it. And so whatever the king does, uh, we rebel to it. Plus, Andrew II was strongly influenced by his wife, Gertrude of Merania, uh, who uh, was uh, the also regent during her husband's absence. Uh, she was German, and the Magyar nobility did not like her particularly, right? She was making the, of course, the the, uh, the game of, of the husband, protecting um, the, the German uh, agents that, again, were working for the king, etc. So um, this ex open expression of, prefer of her preference for her German compatriots led, likely, we don't understand... Uh, to precisely this, to her assassination by a group of local lords in 1213 uh, in the Peleus Mountains during a royal hunting expedition, which was part a bit of the uh, grand style of uh, ro Hungarian royalty uh, as a just even echoing like one of the nomadic life every once in a while moving the court somewhere to to practice this ancient noble uh, sport uh, of hunting the sport of the noble properly and this you know violence is, is is bad enough evidently and a new uprising broke out while the king by the way was in the holy land on his crusade the fifth one right in uh, 1217 and 1218 think in this sense about also the opportunities and the risks for a 13th century monarch with again with the ridiculous coercive power of, of of the middle ages compared to our own at least the lack of centralizations of uh, centralization of communications the, this uh, possible uprising you you will go away for years and still that as a way of forging connections uh, alliances sort of putting the name of your of your leadership forward etc can reward um, your country as well. We will talk more about uh, say the, the participation to crusades also from kings from and, and, and others to, to understand really what was there to gain practically. It cost really a lot. Finally there was a movement of royal servants that is the 
actually the, 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 the free land holders directly subordinated to the sovereign that had acquired as such a great power, uh, that obliged Andrew II to issue his golden bull in 1222. This bull essentially summarized the royal servants' liberties, including their tax exemption. So it's fascinating that these uh, royal servants were somehow afraid of the current times so that they needed their uh, liberties being reaffirmed by the sovereign, the traditional liberties. Again, this is also fascinating because a royal servant was uh, technically a freeman in the kingdom of Hungary during, during this period, right? But of course, the, the, the way their status had evolved uh, had still to do with a sort of clan to private clan to connection with the king and as we've seen how easy it was for these kings to really change right at their um, you know in, in, in power so uh, others uh, even selling royal lands in the process so this this situation scared this these individuals uh, and the last provision of the golden bull 12 22 authorized the secular and spiritual lords to quote resist and speak against the sovereign uh, without uh, like in case this rights had been in fact um, infringed quote without the charge of high treason so they had a sort of special status as far as their again attitude even towards the King really uh, was uh, in virtue of what was, of course, also uh, an amount of duties that, in fact, they had towards the monarch. Uh, and this is important because it, it, it shows a societal concern that could undermine, at this point, even royal power uh, from at least the, the basis of the single sovereign one in, in, a, war, in, a, in a country of oligarchy. Right, so they cared, of course, about the monarch to remain strong in their connection to him. Uh, more or less around this time, the structure of charters of grant underwent a significant change. Uh, we have the introduction of a narrative section about the beneficiary's heroic acts in the king's service, for example. So uh, th this highlights even, you know, how in fact these people were called uh, to up to arms uh, to defend the sovereign's prerogatives, which included defending the land in some, in some circumstance, because it was a royal one. Um, and this is an incredibly important source of information for the 13th century Hungarian, uh, let's say Hungary in general, just the Hungarian monarchy, even more than chronicles themselves, that as we will see now, weren't particularly developed, let's say, compared to what you see in neighboring, I don't know, Germany or Italy, etc. Um, that are also interesting. I worked with uh, with some Hungarian source sometimes, and at some point I will in fact make it, at least talk about it uh, when I'll talk more about the Battle of Markfeld specifically. It also so, as you know, a Hungarian Kuman uh, involvement. Now, the Golden Bull of 1222 also prohibited the employment of Muslims and Jews in the royal administration. This is yet another important demonstration of, of the power, at least, of royal servants. Uh, here, it's not just them that uh, are negotiating for this. Of course, there is a lot of infiltration of political influence for, from other actors, right? But the idea is that... Um, Nobody here wants, essentially, just the king to become more powerful uh, at the expenses of of people who are here now accepting, essentially, to pay the new taxes, but not uh, through, uh, say, giving money to, to these figures that were also protected by other, uh, of course, some armed hand uh, at the uh, at, at the service of the king. So, in other words, uh, the 
of course, the king was trying to professionalize his forces to, let's say, hinge itself himself from just the, the dependence on specifically local communities and just getting the necessary amount of money uh, for eventually hiring troops uh, at Similia in the pursuit of his uh, centralistic agenda. This uh, ban, by the way, of the, the Muslims and the Jews was confirmed when the King Andrew, urged by the prelates of the kingdom, issued the Golden Bull's new variant in 1231, which essentially authorized the Archbishop of Estergom, uh, the uh, primatial see of the Catholic Church in, in Hungary, to excommunicate the same king in the case of his departure from such provision. Now, this, this is also fascinating because it's a way for the church that also represented one of the great landowners of the kingdom and that had, generally speaking, remained loyal to the king, uh, concerned for this uh, increase in power that could, uh, of the monarchy, could control more the church. And so the, uh, the capacity of the church to be recognized consensually by the estates of the kingdom as uh, essentially the, the only authority that could at that point ex excommunicate literally the king if such compromise especially with not Christians had occurred in, in the royal administration. This was evidently a deeply felt uh, issue because again Jews and Muslims fundamentally depended on the king. There was nobody out there that would have simply accepted them right as part of their community otherwise right at least you know there were lots of them living just eventually mixing with, with the local population but there were not people provided with such great power like this this uh officers fundamentally were right and by the way uh for non-christians who continued to be employed in the royal household the archbishop robert of estergon placed the realm under interdict in 1232. So that, in, in, in theory, there were some properly limitation from the exercise, from the administration of, of, of rights uh, to, to, the, to the entire kingdom, right? And so uh, triggering a, a, a major wave of opposition to the royal provision uh, when non-Christians would, would have continued to be employed in the royal household, right? And Andrew, you understand these are very heavy uh, agreements that uh, Andrew is actually forced to swear on. There is a general sense of intolerance towards non-Catholics, for example, in the uh, transfer of the Orthodox monastery of Visegrad to the Benedictines in 1221. And this, in part, was a way to consolidate the realm as a well, whole, because a single faith is definitely better. But there is evidently also a hierarchical need to do so, right? In a sense, the realm would benefit from it, again, overall, but it's also about how who would benefit it within it uh, in, uh, in the end. And even if the, the church and the oligarchs are fundamentally the ones that um, are advant advantaged by that because they kind of get more of what instead would have been distributed to, to other minorities, including their possessions, uh, etc. And again, some of these measures were also supported by the king, but the kings had always played this sort of uh, minority card to play on different actors within the kingdom and try to maintain a balance. And as we will see, the thing did really continue, right? And the most uh, famous example came from the east. First of all, uh, the eastern frontier of the kingdom of Hungary is quite interesting because basically you have uh, the, the Carpathians and you have even... In theory, th these lands all nominally falling under the um, the dominion of, of the Hungarian king, and even beyond, right into uh, the steppe, you have, in fact, Andrew II making several attempts to occupy the neighboring principality of Alich again, uh, and made 
a video about that and we talk in fact about the Hungarian not only those interference here we are in already in in post-Mongol times, at least as far as the Rus is concerned here. So there are various interference, not just from uh, the Mongols, but uh, that will push uh, westwards, in fact, in the same Hungary as we will see. But uh, also by the other European neighbors who are essentially trying to take over countries that can't defend themselves anymore, because that's the point, right? No country can receive support from others if it can't just defend itself. Von Clausewitz is quite eloquent about this and that speaks volumes about lots of things. Um, in any case, the say, there would be a lot to say and I hope we'll do it at some point regarding the extremely fascinating ethnic background of all these various areas like the difficulty of controlling uh, the Carpathian Basin from the Hungarian Plain, uh, the of course the important limit, like the bulwark that the same Carpathians posed to, towards the east and all those uh, nomadic peoples that had kept well uh, living, let's say, at the outskirts, southern outskirts of the Kivan Rus um, historically. Um, but Andrew the, uh, the second son, Bela the Fort, persuaded, interestingly enough, a group of these peoples, the Kumans, uh, that had essentially been uh, that the main population there, uh, Turkic origin, or originally from Central Asia, and settled as the, you know, uh, in uh, the, depending on how they were called sometimes, uh, the Polotsi, you know, the Kumans for, for the Westerns, the Kipchaks and Eastern sources, but there is also a lot to say about who these people were concretely, right? But to accept, at least, under the second suzerainty, because they had been invested by the Mongols as well and made a, a bit about their military style, etc. in the Eurasian Steppes Warfare video that explains the relation with the Rus, military-wise, etc. Basically saying, look, uh, I'm the, you know, the essentially westwards the most useful, um, you know, uh, lord right and you can't basically take refuge from the mongols in uh, uh in in my land right uh consider that these peoples had been defeated among the other things on the battle on the kalka river because they had been fighting together with the rus against the, the mongols so uh it was a in eastern europe the situation was pretty unstable the comments accept uh, the andrew the seconds suzerainty, and the monarch establishes for them a new mark in Oltenia that would be essentially the, the Banate of Severin, or the Banate of uh, Jorani, if I pronounce it uh, correctly. Um, and uh, this was initially a, essentially in the southern frontier of the kingdom, it initially was in an anti-Bulgarian fashion, eventually even in an anti-Ottoman uh, one. Right, but it was founded by Prince Bell in 1228, um, or actually, well, it was established. Then the, 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 I don't know how the timing would they were settled, but until 1231, and surely also later were further movements right for the settlement. However, mostly is within this two dates, its time span, uh, and, and the Kumans are literally settled there, uh, and not only, as we will see. Um, because this force will essentially become a, a sort of um, second uh, military force for especially the Hungarian king. Right At some point, as we will see, the same Hungarian royals will have Kuman blood right soon here, so the... Uh, the, the mechanisms would become very close, especially with royal power, right? To rely on an army, essentially, of again, of, of outcasts, technically, because they weren't like the, the others, they were settled, the other peoples, they were settled, by the way, in, in places where they retained even the, the, their part of the no, nomadic lifestyle, right? In some of the the, the steps of, of hunger, so some areas that had remained uh, large, not that different from the time of the Saint Magyar uh, settlement, 
so that they would retain part their their military fitness in that in that fashion. Uh, Bella the Fort. Uh, at this point, he was a prince. Uh, he succeeded his father, Andrew, uh, in 1235. And Bella's attempt to reacquire crown lands alienated by his predecessors, right, created, remember, the same father fundamentally, a deep rift between the monarch and the lords, uh, just as the Mongols were basically next door. Uh, so quite tense situation, um, because Hungary, just like Poland, would have been, in fact, uh, just invaded first, like than any other uh, Central European country. Bela was first informed of the Mongol threat by the Dominican friar Julian, who um, was one of of a group of Hungarian Dominicans that left Hungary in order to find those Magyars, who according to the chronicles remained in the eastern homeland from their uh, Ugrofinnic forest in south of the Urals, etc. And uh, he, they had reached uh, Volga, Bulgaria, that, as we've seen also in their military organization, did rule over some, some Ugrofins, etc., but uh, these are the same years, to make a long story short, of the Mongol uh, arrival in, in Eastern Europe. So they actually meet with the uh, with these movements, and they uh, they report back home. Uh, so the, the, it's also fascinating again this travel from Hungary to the so-called to the Magna Hungaria, right? The great Hungary, ancient Hungary, the one, the ancestral home of the Hungarians. So again, the connections with the East uh, were always very strong. In if you look at, especially the Hungarian High Middle Ages, uh, there's the sense that contacts, the awareness of the Eastern uh, connections and origin, etc., was always alive among these people. So we're also essentially building, also for the first time. Um, a more solid kind of historiography, literally, um, and so they had to um, to explain, in a sense, how the, the same Magyar realm had been established, but for the source, it was complicated in the 13th century, considering that we're talking about events that took place some hundred years before, but this gives you also sort of the timeline, uh, in the meanwhile, to understand, like, the of of the of the development of this uh, of the state from essentially a semi nomadic or semi nomadic uh, background uh, into a well established political territorial feudal and at this point essentially Western reality uh, broadly meant which uh, is a testament to the accomplishments of, of the Myers uh, in this. Uh, there was a common chieftain, Kuthen, also known as Kurten, right? That agreed, among others, because they weren't like all acting unitarily; they were all different tribes, to accept Bella the Fort's supremacy. And thus, he and his people were allowed to settle in the Great Hungarian Plain. These were the ones that essentially opened the path. There would, would be other groups later on, but the Kumans would remain prevalent. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, initially, the Kuman culture and background wasn't really liked by the locals, because it doesn't matter, again, how much uh, step connection it could be uh, in, you know, in in with Hungary, right? But the uh, the people there were something very different. They were sanitarized, they were, at least largely also from a historical point of view, the, the, the majority were, were pre-existing populations, uh, not just the descendants, of course, of, of the of the nomad invaders that had reversed themselves in the Hungarian plain historically. But again, these are somehow savages. I mean, there is no way to, to, to go around this. Of course, every people has uh, their own dignity, etc., but the, the lifestyle of these people is really primitive, it's really, uh, it's really violent in a way. These guys know naturally well whom to obey, but they feel also, you know, 
to have a special privilege uh, uh, in the connection with the king of such a big uh, realm. And of course, they tend to act aggressively against the the other uh, communities, especially the oligarchs that were, of course, the ones who said, "Who are these guys now?" Right now, it's as if all an enormous amount of power was just poured in. We're talking about at the smallest mm, some tens of thousands of people, right? And it, this was not just a. a once in a while phenomenon. It would be other groups that would move more or less spontaneously. But also, just imagine the world at the time. It, would, it, it, it was relatively easy to have someone right entering your boundaries, etc. But this done is also made in grand style and somehow accepted, tolerated by royal authorities. There was also a sense these people were, uh, of course, some for, sort of the enemies, uh, of course, because... We've seen how, of course, any non-Christian documents were not, were still pagans, let's say, uh, were, were looked like. And, of course, these look pretty similar to the Mongols, at least from the eye of a sedentary man. There were ferocious steps, warriors, etc. And so some said, these are the vanguards of the Mongols, where, in fact, they were... Uh, more than else, the, the relics of a people had been broken by the same Mongols, and that, yes, in part, they joined the Mongols too at some point, uh, made multiple videos showing of its steps, arms and armor to this point, and you see even the Mongol army, a lot of you know, these people's influence. But at least those who came in, in Hungary now were to, at least the Mongols had not yet invaded, but people wondered, like, what if these guys turn, uh, in, uh, say, to the Mongols, while they are in Hungary, they can be a sort of fifth column of sort. Now, Batu Khan, uh, the Mongol ruler, founder, by the way, of the Golden Horde, the son of Yoch, in turn, the eldest son of Temujin, right, who was the commander of the Mongol armies invading Europe, demanded uh, at the gates of Hungary, uh, Bela the, the Fort's surrender without a fight in 1240. Uh, I made a pretty long video explaining, like in multiple ones actually, the uh, just a general think of the Mongol invasion of Europe, right? The forces involved, what kind of political strategic objective these peoples had, how to accomplish it what they thought, what probably they were also quite impressed by when they were in Europe, etc. This was essentially a massive uh, expedition that wanted to test essentially what the, this second layer of European defense after Eastern Europe that had crumbled pretty easily. Uh, at least, you know, there is always a divide there in terms of what can a step people accomplish. Uh, you know, because senators are going to remain senators and eventually are going to to remain to, to, to develop more than the nomads and taking them over, but the sense of you know this you, then we have Poland and Hungary and we have to test for our forces reasonably uh, in, in one shot what these guys are made of. So there is a massive. Uh, there are different columns actually that attack in different uh, regions. They have to to join each other. They have to make this grand tour. Uh, crossing the two countries and then coming back home because there was factually no. Uh, occupation of these two countries, in spite of the even of, of the pitched battle success that the Mongols uh, achieved on the Poles, on the Germans, on, on the on the Magyars, right? So it, it's it's a big deal. It's a massive invasion. It, it's something again enormous, but it's not aimed uh, at the permanent occupation of those lands, let alone a sort of broader conquest of the entire uh, continent that fundamentally was not possible, right? And uh, for very precise reasons that would have been more readily evident, especially when invading Germany or Italy, uh, and especially having all these other territories far away from the, the oil fields of, of the Mongol army, that is, that, that is the, the pasture once actually of uh, north north of the Caucasus, right? So, uh, in any case, uh, the uh, king refused, which is what a king must do, because nuts, you know, the fuck are you in the first place? And 
uh, Yeri ibn uh, Hanid, etc. So Bela orders his uh, barons to assemble with their retinue in his camp at Pesht. That is the, the, the praxis, right, of gathering, the summoning the essentially subject forces, the, the feudal ones plus others. And, and here the Kumans are also present because they are now at the command of Bela, but a riot broke out against them uh, so that the mob massacred the Kuman leader, the aforementioned Kukan. This again is not a good thing because indeed does show a, a, a break, a fixture, uh, a discrepancy within the, the Hungarian, uh, let's say at least the multi-ethnic Hungarian uh, forces, uh, and even worse, because the Kumans objectively do soon depart uh, out of this uh, offense and pillage the central parts of the same Hungary, which naturally is done in the expectation of a major mess, given that they know what the Mongols are about, so they just say, you know, yes, we tied ourselves to, to the to the to this local king but he can't even protect us and the Mongols are attacking so let's pillage a little bit because that's exactly you know, what they were designed to do in the first place even just from a from a military point of view that there was a sort of core force again of, of feudal elite right and then this loss of light uh, cavalry and mostly there were of course heavy common uh, forces but they were the main staunch minority within the steppes force now the main Mongol army arrived through the northeastern passes of the Carpathian Mountains in March 1241. We can imagine also beautiful places, but the same ones of, you know, of Dracula, of the, you know, and, 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 and you have, uh, again, imagine just all the intelligence, the, re reckon, the reconnaissance, the, the exploration that the Mongols were very famous for, uh, and that was put at great work here even through such uh, insidious territory. But there was not much that could be done to stop them in the first place there. Uh, the Hungarians awaited for them in their uh, ethnic core land, or the open plains of Hungary, uh, that are crossed by considerable rivers, uh, not just the Danube. And so the, um, the idea is uh, to, to try to, to block the, the passage of the Mongols in these battles and hopefully preventing the country to be ravaged. Uh, so that, uh, in fact, the royal troops meet with the Mongols at the river Sayo, uh, or Slana in, in Slovak, but this is in fact in Slovakia, uh, and, and Hungary as well. Uh, and the Mongols win here, uh, uh, a remarkable victory in, in the Battle of Mohi on April the 11th, 1241. The Battle of Mohi is one we have to, to describe at some point in depth because uh, it, it really shows how difficult it was, even, even in, like always, like for the Mongols to, to for anyone to win, right? And the 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 actual uh, problems in maneuvering this terrain, etc., so that you understand it's not just that the Mongols walked in, right? But it also, of course, shows the, the degree of unity of command, of, you know, sense of of, uh, of leadership and strategic vision that they had in the first place. Um, this was a, a disaster, of course, for the Hungarian kingdom because the, the army was, was destroyed. Bela IV himself first fled to Austria, uh, where the Duke Frederick II held him for ransom, by the way. The Austrians were, were not very cooperative in all this. I mean, at least they, that's also a scene that repeated itself with the Ottomans later on, of course. Austria, I made a video about the Duchy of Austria, by the way, at this point was one of the most powerful in the Holy Roman Empire. Everybody coveted it. And it was deeply intertwined uh, politically with Hungary and, and Bohemia. And everybody hated each other, predictably. Uh, and uh, this was, of course, uh, a moment of major weakness of the uh, the Hungarians. The the Austrians had not really helped more than much in the first place since it's joined Christian effort against uh, the Mongols, uh, and they exploit the situation uh, like that, 
right? Um, and actually, it, 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 uh, Bella is ransomed, so that the king and his family flee. However, Hungary proper they take refuge in the fortress, uh, the fortress of Clis near Split in Dalmatia. So in in the uh, in, in the kingdom of Croatia that is under essentially the, the Hungarians, but it's technically in fact uh, another country. Uh, and this tells you how you know devastating for the, the blow that the Hungarians suffered uh, at Moy and, and after that, because the Mongols first occupied and thoroughly plundered the territories east of the river Danube. Uh, an eyewitness account of the devastation of Eastern Hungary was compiled by Master Roger, uh, an Italian prelate active in the Kingdom of Hungary. In fact, at this point, who was also Archbishop of Split in Dalmatia uh, later on until his death. Uh, at, at the at the uh, at the time, he was archdeacon of the cathedral chapter at Barad, right? So he had, uh, you know, he was just there, sowing this 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 uh, uh, sort of apocalyptic scenario. Uh, and so the, the the Mongols remained within this sort of outer, uh, still step, right, east of the Danube, in, within the same Hungarian. Uh, territory because uh, of course it's it's well suited still for as the the westernmost step area for for their horses etc. But of course it's surrounded by enemies. Uh, again, they just entered, but they haven't literally taken control of everything. There are some uh, fortresses, of course, that were holding out. So this was the main problem for the Mongols, technically, for you know, an eventual idea of or plan of invasion of Europe, because they would have literally had to stop at every single castle harassed by people who were technically very advanced already, and they would quickly be already more than them, especially the westernmost, uh, the Mongols would have gone. In any case, they take their time to make the most of this ravages, and they cross the Danube when it was frozen in early 1242. Right, so it was evident that they they had to move on. First of all, it was just they would have come back at some point, and that they weren't so eager just to organize the local place. They, again, they, the Mongols were being advanced. Doesn't matter that you can't be primitive or savage in many ways. So the so the capacity of these people to handle you know Central Europe in a sort of civilized fashion is is quite doubtful. Overall, it's not that they could have not ruled over it temporarily, but they would they would have still suffered significantly from a sort of isolation within this world. They would have had to come back to the step, to the real step. Um, now, on learning of these acts, Hermann, the abbot of the Austrian Niederaltai Abbey, recorded uh, the following quote: "The kingdom of Hungary, which had existed for 350 years, was destroyed." Right? Actually. The King of Hungary continued to exist, but the damage was so, so strong that it was really seen like what's going to be after this. But right? in fact, as we will see now, the, the the Hungarian capacity to recover, at least as a as a unitary government, was, was remarkable. There's a beautiful passage from a letter of the aforementioned Master Roger on the destruction of his same Barad by the Mongols. So the, uh, Master Roger writes, The Mongols burnt the church in Varad together with the women and whatever there was in the church. In other churches they perpetrated such crimes to the women that it's better to keep silent. Now you can't just imagine. Then they ruthlessly beheaded the nobles, citizens, soldiers, and cannons on a field outside the city. Right. After they had destroyed everything and an intolerable stench arose from the corpses, they left the place empty. People hiding in the nearby forests uh, came back to find some food, and while they were searching among the stones and corpses, the Mongols suddenly returned, and of those living whom they found there, none was left alive. Right, you would think, oh my god, this is like uh, the the usual rhetoric, because we all know that Christians lie, they have to say stuff about pagan... You know, we perfectly know and very well what the Mongols did everywhere they went. So there is no need to come up with this BS. Like, this is real stuff. 
it happened on a regular basis. I mean, don't think that anybody at the time was that particularly sensitive to human life. But surely the Mongols were at another level of, uh, you know, psychiatric trauma as their own existential identity, right? That is the only reason you can think why this actually primitive people who also remained primitive after this was capable of even creating the the, the impressive empire that they did. Um, but these things were normal for them. Right, they ju just literally thought they were another thing. They were of another stock that would kill everybody they found, and this again reinforces the the idea of what eventually happened, aside from broader political issues, that they didn't plan, of course, to remain in Poland or in Hungary. Uh, they hadn't invaded for that purpose, and they realized immediately this 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 behavior is is just quite telling. Now, Batu Khan withdrew his entire forces when he was informed of the great Khan Ogodei, uh, the death, death um, in March 1242. He was the second Khagan of the Mongol Empire, the third son of Genghis Khan. Uh, and uh, this is generally said, well, you know, that's where they retreated. Well, they had already started retreating on their own. I mean, this was a major expedition that was to come back at least north of the Caucasus in the first place, and then from there eventually rearassing Europe, retrying. I mean, Poland was invaded thrice later on. But the. I mean, in this accounting, the same invasion of the, of, uh, of the Battle of Lenitsa. But uh, it. This this is not just the, what saved Europe from I don't know the the conquest the Mongol conquest that would have not happened right they, they could have tried but it would have not likely been very uh, you know successful let's put it in this way now Hungary don't get me wrong it suffered disastrously of this invasion I mean of course when you look at the impact that the Mongol invasions had on countries like the, the Rus especially. Um, especially, like Eastern Europe really changed face uh, compared to the rest of, of the continent. Um, but Poland and, and Hungary also received a radically uh, devastating impact from this, this, this conquest. Like you have generations of development basically just raised to the ground, uh, this is something that suffered definitely in the historical development of these countries. It didn't help anyone. Uh, it was not a chance to, to rebuild or something. We we know that it left a, a devastating trace and that it, it disordered further uh, these countries for the problems they may have had before. There was uh, a famine following uh, that, uh, you understand, if, if the people were treated the way they were, uh, in Master Roger's account, you understand that there would be massive agricultural demographic issues, at least for displacement, like really, labor force, things like that, uh, just destruction of the fields, etc. That the Mongols, of course, ravaged, uh, say, uh, foraged this. Uh, I made a video specifically about on Mongol logistics. They, they literally took away all, all the, the, the grass, like everything for their horses that consumed. Um, uh, an unspeakable amount of uh, of fodder, uh, of grass, etc., and, and that damaged dramatically such sedentary economies that, you know, at the time, were also incredibly fragile, just by themselves. So this this really impacted these countries in, in an incredible way. Uh, it's been estimated. It, naturally, it's very difficult to do so precisely, but still that at least 15% of the Hungarian population died or disappeared during the Mongol invasion of the country. So, that that's it, right? Uh, transcontinental trading routes disintegrated as well, um, so that, you know, somebody wouldn't pass where, of course, the Mongols were, but also there, were, there had been so much damage locally that uh, certain... F centers fall from from grace like they had had an importance in you know in trade especially and in you know as markets and the, the, of course flourishing because of the surrounding agricultural surplus where they 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 went down for example Bach, uh in in serbia uh in vojvodinia specifically uh Hungbar, that is Uzorod in in ukraine 
and other traditional centers of commerce in, at, at the frontier of the Hungarian kingdom uh, declined sharply. Right. Also, inter interestingly enough, local Islamic communities essentially evaporated after this. Uh, they seemingly suffered uh, a lot after this invasion, in part possibly because of, as we've seen, their involvement in commerce, etc. So that maybe they were already uh, more mobile, they, they literally abandoned the country for good. Uh, small villages, in part, disappeared. Uh, there is definitely this, this destructive phase, but of course we're also talking about uh, the force of a uh, of an invading uh, army that came and went a couple of years, so technically, of course, they couldn't destroy everything, nor just uh, the, the majority of some years, just the, the, the human settlement. Like, humans also adapt. You you hear Master Roger there saying people had taken refuge in the forest. That many would have just starved to death, etc., like in that case. But, right, the, the Hungarian kingdom was built essentially with this chain around the various mountains in Slovakia in uh, in the Car uh, the Carpathians the also partly in Serbia where people could simply that had all, uh, they mostly slavic lands that had always um organized themselves to resist the the harassment of the surrounding nomadic peoples, including the ones inhabiting the nomadic plains under uh, the, excuse me, the Hungarian plain, uh, that um, they they were formally subjugated to. Like these were at the time of the Hans, of the Avars, of the Magyars. These were people, sedentary peoples that were to pay tribute to the uh, to whoever inhabited there, but they were also, in fact, different, and so it's likely that would be interesting to know whether those places specifically that also the, the Mongols stayed mostly away from because they of course at some point had to cross some mountains as we've seen the, the, the Carpathians before but they were not fans of forests or mountains etc because they were not good of course for such large armies so they preferred mostly the great riverways the valleys uh, etc in any case, the abandonment of most villages is at least well documented for later times, the, sec the second half of the 13th century, so we're in, in the next generation. Um, and it really had this, uh, of course, mixed causes, right? First, the, the devastations that the Mongols had caused, it was just difficult. Again, it's uh, a bit like the con same concept of, a, of encastellation. You, you go live in better fortified places, at least if you can in certain moments, etc. But there is also a process you find elsewhere in, in Europe that is that had kicked in in Hungary, even though it was, generally speaking, a country with less, you know, with not a great deal of comparatively of population density it's, uh, or communications or urbanization. From the larger, uh, let's say from the smaller villages to larger settlements. That is, again, there are many reasons for that. In general, the world develops, right? The 13th century is still basically the moment of greatest wealth, uh, generalized, say, population, amount of resources in the great medieval civilization before the crisis of the following century. So you find this dynamic surely going on from before even these this problems. But surely they it, it likely increased. And by the way, uh, this overlaps with the former crisis that we were talking about, the one of the freemen, right? If Hungary was historically, like, again, an agricultural land, even without too much of urban centers, or at least particularly developed ones, etc. What you see in the growth of these centers is not really a, I don't know, much of a communal um, growth or a greater autonomy. No, th these places are still run by the, the more powerful people. And all these uh, villagers coming to live in, in the city are essentially doing so because they're also relatively desperate, right? It's not much that there are such absolutely better living conditions. It can be desperation because of these raids, etc. But it, 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 it doesn't speak of the 
increase of individual liberty uh, as sometimes it's instead I mean there, there was a time in of course in European history in which this was true like by the 10th the 11th century it was a great process of urbanization that brought those who migrated there at the time to eventually become the say to, to increase the bulk of the citizenry but in the 13th century the citizenry rules and, and together with noblemen etc over this masses of uh, emarginated now that come from the the, the countryside without any great capacity than working in some of the local uh say industries if there were even etc and so being always in a subordinate uh position there is also a uh an important passage like in, in Hungarian history in the second half of the thirteenth century as far as the end of the Arpad dynasty that had ruled the country since the, the foundation of the king at least uh and and before already with great power uh, and the, the rise of the Angevins of the french the Nepoli, french napolitan Angevins. now uh, after the mongol withdrawal bella the fort um abandoned his policy of recovering former crown lands right because uh the, it was a moment of reconstruction he uh, essentially limited himself to grant large estates to his supporters that in part were in fact provided with areas that had gone depopulated or you know uh, so that could be you know loss of land had remained without people and so this distribution in a sense could be done more easily without hurting the crown lands uh, there was similarly to Poland a process of fortification there was a set almost of military reforms, right? Uh, the king urged the noblemen to construct stone and mortar castles to increase the importance of weapons like crossbows, for example, that would in fact become quite, uh, uh, let's say, feared by the Mongols that in fact in this later time begin to hire lots of western uh, crossbowmen uh, from uh, for for their own armies as far as the Ilkhanate. Uh I made again the videos about these topics as well, so we will keep observing them. But I mean, the idea that the, the Mongols were the hyper powerful ever thing that were so advanced, and you know the West was just suffering. This is is just an incredibly uh, wrong idea, uh, and it mostly stems from the just an underappreciation of still how resilient Europe was and how actually you know, capable of in part threatening had they wanted that the same Mongol presence in some parts of Europe etc. Now but I mean Eastern Europeans would be enough of some, you know, a couple of centuries right so that um, you know that tells you everything I guess. Um, Bella initiated uh, a new wave of colonization, by the way, because it was a huge opportunity. Again, there was a lot of free land, right, in this perhaps not most appealing uh, areas, but uh, for many German, Moravian, Polish, and Romanian uh, colonists, this will do, right? The 13th century, again, sees the peak of things like the German Ostsiedlung. Uh, you have again also Poles and Romanians so people that were in part even displaced by these phenomena right they were called to uh, to settle right to replenish the demographic because again you can't have a lot of land but if nobody works it is worthless right you need labor force you need people who work to create to create stuff um, the king also reinvited the Cubans after that uh, unhappy uh, parting and settled them in the plains along the Danube and the Tisha rivers. So that, that's it's an area that had historically been somehow uh, somehow a frontier. This is the, the the older Sarmatian corridor. This is a bit of a no uh, no man's land. Also between in the time during the times of the Longbirds from the side of the Danube and the Gepids from the side of the Tisha. Uh, this is the Kunsak right that is also known in fact as Kumania 
uh, in Latin as Cumanian in, in German, as we'll see now. We, we were saying before there were lots of Germans that start inhabiting parts of, uh, of Hungary. Um, and a group of Alans, even the ancestors of what uh, of the Jash, the, the Yasek people, um, so this in fact Hungarian subgroup of Eastern Iranic descent, uh, seems to have settled in the kingdom around the same time. Just bearing, I made multiple videos about the Alans, especially the one uh, uh, in the Migration Era series, tells you a bit the story also well into the Middle Ages, which rarely happens because most migration era peoples were absorbed right by others including the islands but there was this remin in, in Europe there was this reminiscent people in more or less today's session and surrounding lands that somehow uh, sheltered itself on the Caucasian foothills and continued to provide especially very fine bodyguards for great empires like the same Mongol one for example throughout the entire Middle Ages also in, uh, in the West historically they were just the, the epitome of the warlike people they maintained this tradition and every once in a while they would migrate uh, in uh, and at this point there were lands at hand in Hungary some of them moved there uh, as well so as a consequence new villages appeared uh, most of the architecture at this time uh, consists of timber houses built side by side in equal parcels of land. So there is a sort of rationalization, a feudal direction in this sort of, you know, efficientation. I don't know if it is a term in English, but, you know, in, in other <laughs> languages we have it. Uh, and uh, it ergonomically, we find uh, areas... Uh, that had historically been scarcely inhabited. For example, the, the forests of the Western Carpathians, especially in present-day Slovakia, that developed uh, a network of settlements under Belo de Fort, interestingly enough. And th this ha surely had st some strategic implications, because, again, these were frontier areas. So Bela was... Um, th th there was here all attention with neighbors, Right, that could always escalate in some way. So the idea of creating some pop population, some garrisons, uh, etc., um, was uh, relevant. Right. There was some general evolution in the modernization in the type of abodes, huts, for example, became the modé. Right, new rural houses consisted now in a sort of living room with a kitchen and a pantry in it. Um, so you would have new uh, agricultural techniques, uh, including asymmetric heavy plows, spreading throughout the kingdom, etc. What, what, th this is very gradual. Again, there's nothing, oh my god, new technology arrives, we're so advanced, now everything changed. No, it didn't happen at all like that. Uh, first of all, everything was just, these things start, say, developing more consistently, but the, the system is still very traditional uh, to say the least um, also some of these techniques hadn't actually uh, developed in some of the most developed countries <laughs> so especially as far as this agricultural systems are concerned you have to think more of desperation uh, pushing these changes at some point it, this also means that there is some surplus that allows you to do so so it's not again an entirely disastrous situation but don't exchange this for a radical uh, improvement uh, on previous condition. Um, there was also, again, a lot. Every, all of this came from, in part, colonization or even some sort of bourgeois know-how, like the sense that, again, especially the Western settlers were bringing with some sort of more updated, innovative, modern ways of uh, land management, etc. We'll keep talking about this in other videos. But all this was still r managed, organized, visioned by the feudal elite, right? Especially this stuff we listed now, uh, seemingly emerged mostly in the new domains emerging in former royal lands. So, uh, the uh, in part there is again the substitution with new people that had more also dynamic connections with more distant uh, countries. Right, that it's true that uh, the Hungarian uh, agriculture had been somehow less uh, developed, 
historically than the one of some Western neighboring countries. Uh, but in any case, it, it's about, right, it's of a political initiative, of investment, of, uh, of just need of, of these immigrants, by the way, because the new landholders granted were, uh, were um, at this point, were granted in order to populate their lands personal freedom and more favorable financial conditions to those who arrived in the estate. They had to convince them to move, to migrate, to arrive even from far away, right? And they competed with one another. So this, this is what actually boosted the, the thing with the means available. Uh, there was also, paradoxically, a statistization now of uh, the settlement because uh, the all these liber say these uh, these autonomies were also promised to last, right? It made multiple bases. If you go in the medieval uh, society, medieval economy, me medieval countryside, play, you you will find medieval peasantry. These kind of land management uh, contracts in in comparison, like what what's going on in different countries of Europe at this time, what why are there these mechanisms etc so it's never merely a socio-economical thing it's always political primarily right bella the fort granted privileges to more than a dozen towns we observed before that while some centers had decayed also th there is this general increase in importance of single centers and if you uh, that now have grown just by themselves so if you are the king and you grant uh, these rights uh, to such communities, you can hope to connect them, to co opt them essentially, to be somehow more, uh, let's say, independent from the great landowners in the countryside, which is difficult because still this is essentially these uh, towns are connected s still with the nobility, right? They don't have really much of a power outside, but still as local communities, they have their own saying, their own resistance, etc. We're talking about uh, Nagyjombat, that is Trnava, a uh, city in western Slovakia, to the northeast of Bratislava, so some 50 kilometers away, and uh, the same Pest, right, that of course, uh, as is one of the most important centers in the first place uh, in in the kingdom, together with facing Buddha, of course. Uh, and in 1264, you find also uh, an interesting uh, evidence, right, of luxury goods, specifically Oriental velvet, silk, jewels, gems, and Flemish bro uh, broadcloth sold to Bella de Fort's heir Stephen, that would be Stephen V, uh, as king of Hungary, that imported, uh, that indicates how these imported goods were primarily paid for using silver and salt, like it had been a, a thing. Hungary had a large economy, right? They produced really a lot of stuff, also agriculturally speaking. They, they, they knew how to sell raw uh, in some cases also precious material in exchange for commodities that weren't produced by the, the socio-economical fabric of, of Hungary as such, for mostly an elite, right, an abilier one. Uh, and uh, we have also mer a list of merchandise brought to Ghent, uh, in, uh, of course in Flanders, showing that Hungary exported, for example, wax and unminted gold, and silver, so there was uh, an important output and input going on in this trade bounce that helped importantly Hungary to, to reemerge. It had again also more unitary uh, rule. This system had not fallen apart, right? Well, it just made again video about 13th century Poland. You realize that still this country was just a sum of various duchies doing more or less whatever they wanted with each other. Hungary worked different. They had huge problems, but uh, with the oligarchs in a decentralized, de decentralized fashion, but paradoxically there was a greater sense of hierarchy and authority, just intrinsic in this of sort of still steps equaling Magyar uh, mentality that had 
And that also worked basically on the sort of the imperial system and the various surrounding peoples that were tributaries, de facto as subjects. And such unitary control favored also a more rational and functional uh, trade management, right, for the country as a whole. So this this is definitely uh, interesting. Uh, and although threatening letters sent to Bella de Fort by the cans of the Golden Horde proved that the danger of a new Mongol invasion still existed, uh, the uh, Hungarians felt that um, they could profit at least of uh, some situations around them uh, to, uh, uh, to actually pursue an expansionist foreign policy. Uh, the, the reasons that now the, the Hungarian relations with the Golden Horde we can treat in some other video but what was actually concerning Hungary uh, in many ways was what was happening in the immediately western boundaries right while for example Frederick II died at the, uh, Frederick II of Austria died at, at the Battle of the Lysa River uh, against the same uh, Bella right in 1246 uh, and uh, Bela's son-in-law Rastislav Mihailovich that was a Russian prince uh, allowed uh, uh, say annexed large territories of the kingdom's southern frontiers Bela's son-in-law Rostislav Mihailovich was a Russian prince annexed uh, large territories along the kingdom's uh, southern frontiers like this is important because um, essentially the Babenberg dynasty of Austria went distinguished and uh, the Hungarians were sponsoring uh, this Russian branch uh, because of previous marriage in, in the Austrian line this is kind of complicated uh, and there was a race of course for uh, for uh, the southeastern Germany as well because the Babenberg controlled yes there were dukes of, of, of Austria but also of Styria of Carinthia made a video about a medieval Styria by the way it explains that a little better and uh, that was a sort of super state within the Holy Roman Empire that however the Bohemians managed also fighting against the Hungarians on that frontier between again Slovakia, Austria and Hungary um, to to actually incorporate, to annexate, right, to, to dynastically inherit by matrimonial rights uh, by marrying the, the heiress to the Babenberg and um, therefore coming to threaten the same Hungary with, with enormous power again we never made a bit about Ottokar II as well but again I have a master degree uh, that I always remember with pleasure on the Battle of Markfeld it tells you a bit that and you find the Habsburgs fundamentally uh, with Rudolf King of the Romans that allies himself with, with the Hungarians to basically dislodging Ottokar from from southeastern Germany where the Habsburgs installed themselves uh, finally uh, Hungarian history here gets also complicated it was a civilian war of uh, during 1264-65 between Bela uh, and his son the, the Duke Stephen again uh, and this was following uh, generally speaking the pattern of uh, you know again oligarchic backing of these uh, uh, younger heirs that had in fact the right from their side because you know they, they, they were just to the to succeed their fathers and if during their father's reign they, they had defeated him even if they had failed in, in doing so they would have still become rulers later on so the oligarchs still the supporting them was the best card right except normally this would make essentially the the princes uh, later kings more aware of how risky the oligarchic presence really was. I mean, the same Autocar II of Bohemia's enormous ruler was doing the same. He, re he rebelled to his father, backed up by nobility, and he maintained all this great distrust towards them later on in the kingdom, trying to centralize. This is what they were trying uh, to do. In any case, Bella and his son, uh, when they reconciliated, jointly confirmed the liberties of royal servants and started referring 
to them as noblemen even as 1267 so this was sort of sort of uh, gentry recognition i mean this this happened in many other places in europe these people were called noblemen because technically freedom in any european tradition equates to nobility ipso facto right you don't need to be a noble you can be nobler than someone else but the idea that you can still bear arms is is the meaning that you can bear the imperium to to your degree or the one of your chingulum militaris and so that you're some blessed by god in, in this fashion um but the fact that they're just gentry right so uh the there was a distinction in hungary in fact for which the quote true noblemen were specifically and legally differentiated from other landholders to avoid uh, misunderstanding and especially again in a country in which oligarchic identity was so brutally uh, of course contemptuous towards any lesser element of of the population this is typical of central europe in many ways and there is some again their steps sense of authority that increases this autocracy in a way um also towards the king as you understand uh and uh they uh, th- this steward noblemen essentially held their estates in fact free from any obligation right they uh th- this was an old hungarian thing i mean that the identity of the magyars laid in that that they would be free traditionally that's also why they carved this to such great power because they were the only ones who could elect a king that was elected by them as opposed to lording over them as such and uh this was the thing um and this is the reason why they were the only ones who were holding their estates free from any obligation instead the ecclesiastical noblemen that is those privileged people who possessed lands and the domains of wealth or prelates right so of the church and that were obliged to provide military and other services to their lords like uh the, the romanian uh knets or knetches uh that he is uh, essentially these leaders in black romanian communities uh in uh both the kingdom of hungary also in western balkans and other so-called conditional noble or predialists so landowners w- were obliged to render specific services to his to their lord in return for their land holding uh owed services to their lords in exchange for their, the lands they held so again the the absolute privilege of being a true nobleman is like technically you can do whatever the hell you want in virtue of some sort of you know traditional virtue that you embody and you understand it's very difficult to reason with these people uh and you understand why essentially hungary was shattered in in the in this uh, in the wake of such uh, uh inequality right we made a video about matthias corvinus that explains that right how do you say it's not that hunger didn't have resources to defend itself but they were all parceled with people that did their own business sometimes even in agreement with others right you know enemies of of the of the crown etc so this all weakens the crown in the longer run but at this point hungary is a powerful kingdom that say that this level of privatization is still within at least the average uh it's actually more than the average what you see in Europe but still you know it it's not so differentiated as it would grow later right but it's sort of the beginning of the end when you realize it was not changed as a system uh there were also uh increasing uh, numbers of counties local nobility acquired the right to elect four judges of the nobles to represent them in official procedures uh, or two in Transylvania and Slavonia uh, there were also different types of course of autonomies connected with just how the local relation with the rulers had developed historically uh so it, it it's very you understand that this was a very complex system i i like to stress that hungary was more like an empire than a kingdom but it's also true that during the 13th century the sense of hungary as a proper nation at least in this sort of proto-modern sense um begins to emerge 
this is something that, again, is deeply connected to the aforementioned nobility because these are the people who are stressing that since they are Magyars, they um, do not want the, their kings, first of all, overstepping them. Um, traditionally, nor they want, as we've seen, uh, Muslims, Jews, other, they hate the Kumans, they hate anybody who's not like them. It's a bit, a bit like the Polish Schlacht, except in that case they developed a sort of, say the Slavs were the the subjects and they they fabricated, at least at that point, in fact they were Sar heirs of the Sarmatians or whatever, because surely the Poles had Sarmatian ancestry in part, uh, but there is no way to trace that for the Schlacht in say, in a historical fashion, <laughs> like the one they did. So it was a political statement, let's create a nation. Right? You understand how the nation eventually undermines the imperial universal tradition that was at the base of any belief at the time. Because these these people start seeing just themselves, right? They start seeing just their own perspective, and in the process, their country basically loses power at the same time. Um, this sense of uh, Hungarian nationality is expressed, uh, we can't say the first time, in a source that is the one I said I worked on, that are the Gesta Unorum et Ungarorum, known as also more simply as the Gesta Ungarorum, because basically the guy said, the author said that uh, the, the Magyars descended from the Huns, right? So, uh, by Simon of Keza that is definitely the most famous Hungarian chronicler of the 13th century. He was a priest in the royal court of King Ladislas IV of Hungary. This work was written in the 80s of the 13th century. Uh, and it's very uh, funny to read, right? I would say, you know, if you compare it to other sources as they were normally written in Western Europe at the time, you realize that here Hungarian historiography was making a gigantic work to try to make sense of basically anything without a former historiographical uh, tradition affirmed, at least in a substantial way. This was also a sort of royal work, so you, surely there was plenty of uh, oral traditions now forgotten regarding, say, the, the ancestry of the various houses, etc. So, in part, this is, of course, expressed in the Gestam Gararum, but surely there is the equation with the Hans. There are various explanations, stories, etc., that are evidently made up, or at least they have a specific meaning. That sometimes, of course, it would have been evident uh, to the guy that would have explained it to you, but that to us, it, it's not really that much. I mean, when you understand, it starts becoming fantasy. You, you may try to understand sometimes where the purpose is for his time, but at other time, you just say, "Why did you exactly make up this thing?" You know. And I will uh, describe this in another video because it's interesting as a source uh, on its own, and you can you can read it if you are interested. Um, the wealthiest landholders forced, at this point, the um, gentry, say the lesser nobles, to join the retinue. Right. Uh, this shows how uh, the, the system was degrading in an ever more privatistic way. Powerful uh, barons that, again, have a great saying in the rule of the country, etc., that basically uh, subsume this other gentry because they, they have rights, but aside from what can be said by the king, right, the situation on the ground is often different. One of these barons, Joachim of the uh, good cat, let Clan. These were, by the way, all sort of uh, yes, they were Hungarian noblemen by this point, but they were mostly of German ancestry. In some cases, like in this case, Swabians. If I'm not wrong, possibly even tracing back their lineage to at least the proximity the area of the uh, of the Oenschaufen, right? The very castle, somebody says, originally, because this nobleman had started coming in from the eleventh century, from times in which. Uh, certain other families were still, say, not particularly important. They had made their fortune in Hungary. It's also somehow ironic that these would become the people who would stress, of course, mostly the ethnic resistance against the sort of subversive monarchy they wanted to, to change things, because they were not even Magyars themselves. Right. But first, in this case, at least they, they knew the 
uh, of their German ancestry naturally. Well, this guy, Joachim of the Gutkelet clan, even managed to capture Stephen V's heir, the infant Ladislaus, in 1272. Right. And Stephen died, by the way, some months later, which triggered yet another civil war between the Chuck Koshegi, that was also another, um, actually, uh, noble family uh, of German ancestry, and other leading families were attempted to control the central government in the name of the young Ladislaus IV. So here you start finding again the dynamic that was saying before these oligarchs managing even more, let's say, to uh, increasingly, uh, let's say, choke the, the monarchy in a tentacular way, uh, exploiting still the Arpad lineage, right? Now, the interesting thing about uh, Ladislaus IV is that he was known as the Kuman because his mother, Elizabeth, was a Kuman chieftain's daughter. Perhaps uh, the same Kut and Kurt, and we are not sure about that, but truly, you know, uh, she of course was the daughter of somebody important, right? Uh, and uh, Ladislaus would prefer his Kuman kin as even a clear reaction to the nobiliar uh, interference, what he had passed in his minority, right, that, um, of course, would bring him to, to use the this, this command as a sort of army of his own, with which he joined also, for example, the Battle of Markfield uh, successfully, uh, next to Rudolf of Habsburg, uh, defeating and killing, you know, Otto Card II of Bohemia, um, and other successes. Um, that, however, were not enough to strengthen royal authority. In a sense, the uh, fact it would rely on his comments reflected the uh, the obvious reality that the nobility was not controllable anymore. So you actually see that in spite the country remained standing, uh, surely also the Mongol invasion in inflicted an important blow in terms of governability, as far as the development, especially of a central authority, right? And th this, telling the truth, occurred also in in Bohemia, again, in, uh, in Poland, etc., towards the, the elective uh, direction. So it has to do with Yes, also in those countries, uh, uh, a problem of that kind, right? But surely uh, the uh, the invasion, in fact, hadn't helped. Uh, the, uh, the 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 king, on the uh, wake of the prejudices against the Kumans, was accused by the nobility to even have triggered the second, uh, to have caused, to have invited the second Mongol invasion of Hungary, led by Nogai Khan of the Golden Horde and Tula Buga, uh, in 1285 uh, 86. Actually, the Hungarians won uh, because the Mongols were routed by the royal troops. So, that would have not been, you know, uh, surely the word, you always have to, to, to understand that there were sort of negotiations to say, okay, well, what do you give, you invade my country, well, what, what if you undermine this guy's, that oligarch's, let's say, power, etc., can you do that, can you organize, etc., but it's never a good obedience in the first place for the stability of the wall and still the fact that you use your royal troops successfully and risking them by the way to crush the mongols is really uh is really eloquent now ladislas was definitely not liked anyway so he his unlucky reign ended in 1290 with his murder uh at this point the holy see intervened declaring the kingdom of hungary to be a back end thief right and albite the papal curia granted the kingdom to uh, Bella's sister's son, it was uh, Charles Martel of the Capetian dynasty, the eldest son, in fact, of King Charles 
uh, of Naples and Mary of Hungary, the, the daughter of King Stephen V, crowned Prince of King of Naples, the majority of the Hungarians lords chose Andrew the uh, Third, the known as the Venetian. Call like this, by the way, because his mother was Venetian and he was born uh, in Venice. The again the the connection was with this the the Morzini uh, clan, and uh, this this guy was the grandson of Andrew the Second, son of uh, actually a, a prince known as Stephen Posthumus uh, that was of dubious legitimacy, but still played the the oligarchic card because uh, he could simply oppose he had some royal ancestry at least biologically so the, the thing was um, was was okay he was still a guy as, as you understand coming from the outside by some degree so this played together with the uh, the system because Charles Martel was actually a, a strong pretendant I mean at this point the Angevins are really powerful but I mean really really powerful they have uh, first of all, they are part of the entire French power as a well, whole, right? Because this is the Saint Capetian, let's say, uh, family, right? Just what the, the branch of which rules over Naples and Provence and parts of Greece, right? So also forming this sort of uh, chain around Hungary to some degree. I mean, not that they were threatening Hungary militarily in that sense, but he was a, a powerful candidate. One that would, in fact, as you know, the Angevins would install themselves successfully in Hungary and also reform the army. I made a bit about the Hungarian army organization. We see the early reforms of, of the Angevins really boosted forward um, uh, the Hungarian military uh, quality with updating her you know, further to what was back to the strongest military in Europe at the time. And um, it, with, with a further westernization and feudalization of the system. And as such, um, you see essentially uh, the, the uh, yet another civil war, right? Andrew uh, became the first monarch to take an oath in, uh, say, respect the liberties of the church and the nobility before his own crowning right uh, and he was evidently weak because of that he depended on all these people because if he was appointed king bef uh, say just promising the stuff etc having promised the stuff etc uh, these guys could ask him everything could keep on squeezing him right he regularly convoked the prelates the lords the noblemen's representative to ask him please known as diets Right, the Diet of Hungary, known as the Parlamentum Publicum or Generale, uh, that was started, in fact, exactly at this point in the 90s of the 13th century, which um, started to, in fact, develop uh, into a legislative body of of the kingdom. Right, there were all these estates represented, and so it was a parliament, in fact. By 1300, however the Kingdom of Hungary had disintegrated into autonomous provinces because of the situation, uh, ruled by individuals like Matej Chak, uh, that ruled uh, de facto independently in the northwestern countries, counties of medieval Hungary, in Hungary proper, Ladislaus Khan, that ruled de facto independently in Transylvania instead, and Amadeus Abba, or Amade Abba, uh, that was uh, ruling the fact independently the northern and northeastern counties of the Kingdom of Hungary, right? He holds the office of Palatin several times, right? He was also a judge royal, twi uh, royal twice, etc. And they, they also at some point didn't all make a great end, right? Because they played dirty, right? You have uh, other individuals like the Croatian lord, Paul the first Shubich of Bribir, essentially the ban of Croatia, the Lord of Bosnia, uh, that uh, was on its on his own. Um, so all these people didn't um, want the affirmation of 
the Angevins, but they at least resolved themselves to invite the late uh, Charles Martel's son, who was the 12 year old Charles Robert, Charles I, King of Hungary in Croatia from uh, 1308 uh, to his death. Um, this was still a young pretender as such, right? He marched from Croatia towards Buda, and Andrew III uh, died unexpectedly on January the 14th, 1301. So we will see that that's, Charles is the guy that will reform the the kingdom of Hungary will become one of the most important rulers in the nation's history. Um, and we will see uh, the history of the kingdom of Hungary in the 14th century and beyond uh, in another video. Right? Just These are our chronological limits for today. But we can talk about a bit what happened later in perspective, because uh, the most important thing here is that Andrew III's death marked the end of the male line of the House of Arpad, right? That's why also th this period of anarchy had began, uh, because nobody really uh, had known another dynasty, and so this provided again for the oligarchs much greater options to manage the situation. Charles Robert was crowned King of Hungary with a provisional crown, uh, so the, he didn't have much power. Most lords and bishops actually even refused to yell to him because they they said that this was essentially the papal guy sent there without their consent, so they didn't accept this settlement that the Holy See had uh, thought laid out in a, in a intelligent way. Of course, the, the, the papacy was allied with the Angevins, so they were interested in, in that way and uh, as you know the Angevins would rule at some point even in Poland so yeah, they they were enormously powerful at this point um, so what the nobility did was to, what the estates did uh, was to elect king of Hungary the 12 year old Wenceslaus of Bohemia Wenceslaus III um, it was also king of Bohemia and Poland from 1305 by the way, so you, you start uh, having, at this point, this sort of collection of Central European countries, so that uh, a single guy would try to centralize somewhere from getting a little bit of surplus from each one of these uh, states, uh, and then that, in the meanwhile, would, would basically be, be without a king, and so the, the nobility could do whatever they wanted. The reason why they chose Wenceslas was that he descended from Bela de Fort, right, in the female line, though, so this was yet, uh, yes, of course, they attributed some importance to the biological continuity, even through, through women, but it was, the, it was weaker at that point, of course, uh, the male line was the most important thing. Um, so this young king would not consolidate his position. Anyway, um, especially the south of Hungary continued to support Charles Robert conveniently, so that these guys acquired importance as far as the nobility again was interested. Which brings Wenceslas to to leave Hungary for Bohemia in in mid 1304. Um, so as he inherited Bohemia her, her, herself in 1305, Wenceslas abandons his cli claim to Hungary in favor. Of Otto the Third, the Duke of Bavaria, belonging to the Wittelsbach dynasty, that is rising in importance, um, and that uh, in fact does have this brief um, rule uh, in Hungary and Croatia between 1305 and 1307. I mean, Croatia went along because the Hungarians claimed overlordship over it, and so mostly the Croatians followed that. But it's just like to say that this had been a different realm, right? Um, as, hence the imperial nature that we're talking about of the Hungarian crown. So Otto Wittelsbach was uh, also a grandson of Bela IV of Hungary. He was crowned king, uh, but only the Koscheges and the Transylvanian Saxons, interestingly enough, uh, regarded him as the lawful monarch, right? Um, however, for this reason, because the, the Saxons were normally against the sort of nobility that still ruled, because they were colonists, right? So they had somehow, they were Germans, etc. So the, the nobility, as we've seen, didn't like them so, so much, the ethnic one. Um, this is the reason why in the same uh, Transylvania, 
Ladislaus, the aforementioned oligarch Ladislaus Khan captures Otto and essentially expels him from Hungary. <laughs> you know, quite uh, you know, uh, quite a quite a journey there. Um, so the just think of the places, like how how Transylvania could be <laughs> in the beginning of the 14th century. It's just just beautiful to think about. Um, and the uh, then the majority of the Hungarian lords and prelates elects then Charles Robert King at a parliament on October the 10th, 1307. Uh, he is crowned, in fact, with the Holy Crown of Hungary, uh, also known as the Crown of Saint Stephen, right, in honor of the patron Saint Stephen I of Hungary, Arpa, etc. So there's all the, the mystical continuity of the monarchy. The crowning happens in uh, Shekesfehervar by the Archbishop of Eschlergom. That, of course, like this is the full formal blessing. Uh, required by customary law, we are on August the 27th, 1310. So what happens in the next decade is that this guy launches some military expeditions against the oligarchs to restore royal authority because evidently the situation had reached a point that uh, couldn't quite work functionally like that, so Charles is quite uh, the guy here because he manages to reunite the kingdom, especially after the death of the, the most powerful leader, Matthew Chak. Uh, and this especially enables him to conquer Chak's large province in the northeast of Hungary, which is not perhaps the very best, but it offers some opportunities because it's essentially at the border with Poland and uh, essentially the Rus, uh, and those are important lands at this point that Hungary can interfere with more so there is also local support as we've seen for for the monarchy, for the guy, so uh, it's it. And again, we will see this better in the video about 14th century hunger, we will surely talk in depth about all these passages in single videos. It happens more rarely because there are less, uh, you know, there are smaller topics compared to the, this bigger s summaries, right? But of course, it's better to start with something more, uh, more, uh, you know, general. In fact, not to disorientate. Otherwise, I start talking about this out of scratch without context. Instead, it's good. For this to, to be like this. So this is it. Um, a general, very, you know, summarized, superficial version of the history of Hungary during the 13th century. For today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.